What Pope Paul VI said is true. Garabandal is the most beautiful story on earth since the Gospel. Here, what I see is that she reveals herself as a loving mother. Garabandal is not a closed case. Garabandal is not over. I would say Garabandal is alive. My name is Ángel María Rojas. I was born in Burgos, Spain, almost 80 years ago. I entered the Society of Jesus over 62 years ago. I was ordained a priest a little over 50 years ago. And I've dedicated all that time to giving Ignatian spiritual exercises to thousands of people, especially to youth. The apparitions in Garabandal started in 1961. I did not know anything about them. In 1962, in March, I was studying philosophy at the department we had in Loyola, in Gipuzkoa. And in March, Father Ramon Maria Andreo was there. Every year we had spiritual exercises for our parents. But there was a tall, strong man there with a striking complexion who was not the parent of any of us. Father Andreo kept him at his side in the dining room. The apparitions of Lourdes, or Fatima, I don't remember, were the spiritual reading we listened to at meals. And the parents, who were doing spiritual exercises, were surprised that this man and Father Andreo frequently commented between each other what was being read. They made comments on what they were reading. We didn't know more. About the second day, after dinner, Father Andreo introduces himself with this man to those of us who studied philosophy. We had a break and he said, Would you like this man to give you a series of talks on apparitions that are taking place here in Santander? Oh, well, that would be stupendous, phenomenal, great. We kept chatting and whatnot. We all gathered, and this man gave us a conference. He began by introducing himself, a German engineer who lived in Santander. And through a series of circumstances, he heard about Garabanda, that something was happening there. He was Protestant. He was Protestant. Maybe they were apparitions of the Virgin Mary. If I'm Protestant, well, the Virgin Mary, no. But people are saying that there are striking facts, so I went. So he showed up there. And he was there, I don't know if he told us he had been there for two months, because the apparitions had been taking place for almost a year, but we hadn't heard anything about them. This man said, I am Protestant. Theoretically, I do not believe in the Virgin Mary, but I do not understand what is happening there. He told us many things. For example, they're 11 and 12-year-old girls. They're weak, small, from a village in the middle of nowhere. He was very hefty. I could pick one of them up up with one hand, but when they fall into ecstasy, I cannot move even a hand. When any one of them falls into ecstasy, there were four girls. They were very relaxed in appearance during the ecstasies. They moved easily and could move each other while in ecstasy. 
But if I try to move one of their hands, I cannot. Between the prior of the trap, a strong man who was there when I was, and myself, if we tried to lift or move one of the girl's arms while they were in ecstasy, we could not. He told me, I'm used to picking up 220 pound bags. I don't know what an 11 or 12 year old girl weighs, but less than 220 pounds, right? And these girls were very frail. So between him and myself, not only could we not pick them up, but we cannot move them whatsoever. And we notice that the girls make no effort, they're relaxed. I don't understand. He told us a series of stories. When the moment of the apparition of Our Lady arrives, each girl's in her place, either at home, working in the mountains, or whatever it may be. They hear three calls. The first one is a sort of, attention, or be vigilant, something like that. After some time, now. And the girl directs herself toward the place she feels driven to. At the third call, it is an interior call or impulse. She takes off running, she takes off without a watch or anything of the sort. Each girl shows up from a different street and they come together mathematically and simultaneously. Sometimes it happens to all four of them, other times to three or two, because it didn't happen to all four every time. They come together and automatically all four, plop, fall into ecstasy. They fall on their knees. Now Garabandal is a paved village. The roads have asphalt and cement, and there are underground tubes for water. At the time, it was pure mud and stones. When it rained, the village was a quagmire. So the girls came together, and at a given moment, they fell to their knees. I've been told, Maximo did not say this, that oddly, there is a recording of them they're standing, and then suddenly they are kneeling. That is, there's no gradual transition between starting to kneel and moving closer to the ground. No. They're standing, and then in the next fraction of a second, they're on their knees. It made such a noise when their knee bones hit the ground that people trembled. The ground was covered with stones, and sometimes they were sharp stones. This gave the bystanders goosebumps. These girls have broken their bones. Afterwards, they looked at their knees, and they were perfectly fine. And they looked upwards, in a violent position. I know girls who tried to stay in that position for a while. They can't do it. They cannot manage to keep their head so raised. When they did manage to look up for a while, they ended up with neck pains. The girls at Garabandal could keep their head like this for one, two, or five hours, and they had no pain. These girls, with their heads looking up, do not look at the ground or the people around them. They moved and walked around the village, looking upward, without looking at the people, the street, or anything. All four had their sight fixed in the same direction, talking with a hypothetical vision. They see something and talk to someone. We cannot hear what they say or what is said to them, but it is evident that they are talking to someone. They answer, laugh, make frightened faces, all four at the same time. It's instantaneous, and they don't look at each other. They go through different streets of the town, walking, then they stop. The girls easily moved forwards or backwards, and not only within the village, but also around the town, to the cemetery, for example. On one occasion, three girls went to the cemetery. There's a little stream that goes from the town to the cemetery, and there's a little bridge wide enough for one person to cross. Three of the girls were there, holding each other's arms, looking upwards. The one in the middle stepped on the little bridge, and the other two, looking up, crossed in the air without a problem. Everyone saw it. Everybody saw it. 
Later on, they usually went up to the pines, what we call the pines, los pinos. There were nine pines. The way up was terrible. There were sharp stones, it was steep and hard to climb, and astonishingly easy to break a leg going down. These girls walked looking upwards, peacefully, and without watching where they were going. There were rocks and thorny bushes, and the girls were like this, and the people climbed up very carefully, and the girls <laughs> already arrived. They moved around so easily, and what's worse, well, I mean, more striking, is that sometimes they went down backwards. The young men could not keep up with them. It's impossible. The young men running forward could not follow the girls walking backwards. We were told many stories like these, and we were left with our mouths wide open. What is this? This is how I heard about Garabandal for the first time. At the time, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, those of us who studied philosophy were all friends. I went with one with whom I had a special friendship the next day to talk to Father Andreo in his office. We asked him, if we give you a letter for Conchita, who was the most important of the girls because she was the eldest by a year, if we give you a letter for Conchita to present to the Virgin, could you do that? He said, yes, if I send it, because she receives my letters. Since she receives so many letters, they're not given to her because she would go mad. But if it is from me, she will receive it. If you give me your letter, okay, Father, and we left. The other guy, my friend, wrote. I didn't know what he had written. I didn't know what he told the Virgin. He wrote his letter on a piece of paper, and I wrote mine on another one. What did I write? Hmm. Look, I had a problem at the time. I was very tired and exhausted. I was a nervous wreck at the time. I was in my first year of philosophy. Some people told me, you're not going to manage to finish theology, at least four years of theology, if you don't study special studies, as in fact I did in Rome. You won't be able to with this state of health. So maybe it would be better for you to go home. You can leave the society, go home, and continue the career of law that you started before entering the society. But I wanted to be a Jesuit. I was a Jesuit. And on the other hand, I'm an only child. And of course, my parents were looking forward to seeing me celebrate Mass. I still had a lot of years to go. And so what I did was ask the Virgin two things in one. I thought, instead of asking for two things, I'll ask for one that encompasses both of them, that my parents live until I sing Mass, which means I would be ordained and that my parents would live until then. I wrote it down, the other fellow and I got together, and put the two letters in a blue envelope, a little bit smaller than a normal envelope. We put it in a blue envelope and we sealed it. And we went to see Father Andreo. Here we have this letter. We would appreciate if you could get it to the Virgin. After a few days, I receive a letter from Father Andreo that says, I gave Conchita the letter and the following occurred. I was not there. Conchita wrote to me. In the envelope was Father Andreu's letter, Conchita's letter, and the blue envelope. I have the narration from the Civil Guard Brigadier. Alvarez Seco, who saw how the girl, when she received the blue envelope, went into ecstasy and lifted the envelope, says the guard, as if to be read or kissed, without opening it. And at the end of the ecstasy, says, I have a message 
It was about 2 or 3 a.m. The girl wrote to Father Andreo, put the letter in a regular envelope and put the blue envelope inside too. The blue envelope was never opened. The girl did not read it. She lifted it up sealed. The virgin answered a sealed envelope. The girl hadn't read it. She gave her the answer. The girl wrote the letter, gave it to the civil guard brigadier. The civil guard brigadier went down immediately in the middle of the night. It was about three o'clock in the morning. He sent it urgently, priority mail express, etc., etc. Father Andreu received it, he put it in an envelope and sent it to me. If this letter doesn't correspond, let's see. I called a friend of mine who also wrote and the two of us opened it. The girl wrote, Dear Father Andreu, I remember what it said. I've just finished seeing our Heavenly Mother. She told me to tell you, to tell Angel Mari, <laughs> that made me laugh. The Virgin calls me Angel Mari. I'm Angel Maria, but she said Angel Mari. Thank you. Tell Angel Mari that his parents will live until he sings Mass. Tell him that. She also answered my friend's question, asking for something, and she told him that it would be granted to him. Of course, we were shocked. The letter wasn't open. The envelope had not been opened. Your parents will live until you sing Mass. I asked for two things, and both were granted. I did indeed succeed, with difficulties and all, but I did make it to ordination, as you can see. I've been ordained for more than 50 years now, with 19,415 or 16 Masses celebrated. My parents lived until then, and much more. This fact left me saying, Caramba, this is serious. So this is how I started to become familiar with Garabandal. I started because, of course, I continued to delve deeper in my travels, in my dealings with the girls, in my dealings with other people. So, but my first impression was this, that time, the year 1962. What are the arguments that I have in favor of the supernatural reality of Garibanda? I have to base this on the way I studied it in Rome. That is, how the Holy See studies these phenomena. The Holy See published a very well thought out document in which it focuses on three matters. First, the subject or subjects. In Garibandal's case, there are four girls. Four girls. What kind of four girls? Four little girls, 11 or 12 years old. I think that was their age when the apparition started. You also have to take into account that it was the year 1961 and 1962. There was no electricity in Garibanda, to be clearer. Therefore, there was no news. So the people of that town, and specifically these girls, did not know how society was doing. They had no idea that there was going to be a Vatican Council or not. In 1961 it hadn't started yet, but they didn't know anything. Girls at the time, in the year 1962, and from San Sebastián de Garabandal, a small town that was practically cut off from the rest of the world, there was no paved road, it was a horrendous journey, girls who psychologically, or on an educational level, had the psychology of today's seven or eight-year-olds, we could say. So there is no human reason to be able to explain that those four girls did what they did. In unison, the four, when they were in ecstasy, in the name of the Father, all four of them simultaneously stood up and knelt down. The moment they knelt down, all at once, was instantaneous. At the same moment, the things they said were beyond their knowledge. But the things they said about theology, or about how the world was, 
went beyond their knowledge. They didn't know about Fatima or Lourdes. They didn't know that the Virgin appeared and talked to other children. They didn't know that. So they did not have a point of reference to base themselves on. Humanly speaking, from the point of view of these four girls, the subjects themselves, we could say protagonists, it's absolutely unthinkable that there could be a human explanation. That is, we have no choice but to say, objectively, considering the girls, what they said and how they acted, that there is only a supernatural explanation. Secondly, the second argument the Holy See puts forward to study these things is the message. What does it say? So-and-so had an apparition. What does it say? That is, is what it says consistent with Catholic doctrine? If there's an apparition, locution, revelation, whatever we want to call it, and the message has something that disagrees with Catholic views, Catholic doctrine, church doctrine, it's automatically out of question. I've encountered cases of hypothetical visionaries. In their message, there were things against the faith. There were other very nice things, yes, beautiful things. But there were things that went against the faith, automatically out of question, automatically out of question, it's clear. Garabandal's fundamental message coincides completely with church doctrine and with the most current church doctrine. The bishops of Santander themselves admitted it, that the message was very correct and in full agreement with the doctrine of the church. Third. The third element to be able to judge is, has there been fruit? There hasn't been fruit. There's been an impressive harvest. Not fruit, but an impressive harvest on a spiritual level, conversions. I know conversion stories, in plural. I know conversion stories. I'll tell one. The person who converted told me about it a few days later. A French girl named Muriel, officially Jewish, although she did not practice. One of her brothers was atheist, the other was a communist. It was a family that had no relationship with God. This girl was a friend of a young woman I knew in Burgos named Chon de Luis, Ascension de Luis. She used to go to Garabandal on the weekends when she didn't have to work. She loved going. She was a good friend of Conchita. This girl, Muriel, came to Spain. She met Chon de Luis and she stayed at her house. She wanted to get to know Spain a little bit. Chon said, Look, I'm going up to a village in Santander this weekend where some things are happening. I'm not a believer, but if it's curious and you say that it's very beautiful, well, I'll go with you. No faith. When they arrived, the girl, the visionary, was told that maybe the apparition was a devil. If you pour holy water on the devil, the devil runs away. So they gave her a jar of holy water. There was an ecstasy and immediately a group of people formed around the girl, as is logical, trying to see what was going on. Behind the girl was Chon de Luis, Muriel, the Jew, and on the other side, a priest. Behind the girl, the visionary. The girl says, I was told that maybe you're the devil. Oh, you smile. <laughs> right, the virgin is the devil. I was told to pour holy water on you. And the virgin says, then pour it. So then the girl, instead of putting her hand in and pouring a few drops out, she took the jar and poured all that was in the jar. You and I know the law of physics. If I throw at a hypothetical person who was up here, the virgin, let's say, the person, if I throw the water at that person, it falls on you because gravity makes it go that way, according to Newton, right? 
So the girl threw the water in the air. The water turned around and wet Muriel. Not a drop fell on Chondelis, who was next to her. Not a drop fell on the priest on the other side. And Muriel was soaking wet. She said, Before the water reached my feet, I was shouting, I want to be Catholic. Fruits of conversion. It's striking. I know other conversion stories, not as striking. There are very many fruits of healing, of conversions. Positive fruits in people who go with good intentions or neutral ones. Muriel did not go with good intentions, but just to see, out of pure curiosity. So, have there been fruits? Since the year that this started, 1961 until now. And they keep coming. Very many conversions keep happening. I remember that I once told Conchita, people used to say that you were the one behind it all. You're not here right now because you live in North America. You haven't been here for years. And Garibandel is still alive. Conversions continue to take place. And there are still healings for those interested in knowing the truth. Whoever does not want to know the truth covers his eyes and doesn't want to know it. But whoever has the slightest interest in knowing objectively what occurred and what continues to occur, it keeps happening. Conchita, Garibundel is working without you. That is, why do I believe? Simply based on the Church's criteria, I have enough arguments and motives to believe that the Virgin not only acted, but that the Virgin continues to act. As for myself, I said earlier there was a time when I was studying that my nerves were shot to pieces and so on, that I could not carry out a pastoral work of preaching. Well, I've been preaching for 50 years. And curiously, I've been getting better and better. How's that? A personal healing? I was taking a lot of pills at that time. I've stopped taking them little by little. More than physical healing, I would say two things. One, on a spiritual level, at the time, it seemed impossible for me to finish my studies in philosophy and theology and be ordained. It happened. And that I could later work. Well, I've been able to work for 50 years. I've given hundreds of spiritual exercises to many people and written books and so on. So in fact, I have been able to continue working. Since then, when I have any difficulty, I entrust it to the Virgin of Garibanda. I could tell you stories, but I think that this recording should be finished in less than a year. Because if I start telling stories, I would have to make several other films. Because I have noticed her, I have felt her, not physically, but I have felt the Virgin many times. I repeat, the Virgin Mary of Garibandal has granted everything that I have asked for, and, and more. I could go on and on. She goes beyond. So, have I felt the Virgin Mary in my life? Of course I have. Of course I have. I feel the chair I am sitting in. I'm sitting in a chair. I feel it. Now, if you ask me, what do you feel more? The motherly help of the Virgin in your life? Or being seated in a chair? I would say, I feel the motherly help of the Virgin more. Her presence is vital. It's not physical, but vital. I feel her present in my life, in the physical, 
and the events that occur and the change of things when I entrust something to her. Obviously, that I felt her was not a one-time event. Oh, once I asked her for something and whatnot. No, the normal thing in my life has been her continuous help. It's not that she takes away my difficulties. Because it's not about removing difficulties and life is great because there are no problems. No, because in order to reach perfection and holiness, it has to be through difficulties and problems. In the book of Job, in the Bible, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Has not man a hard service upon the earth? It's a struggle. It's a test. If you take away the exam questions from a student, he certainly doesn't fail. But he doesn't pass either. If you take away the obstacles in front of a person running an obstacle course to make it easier for him, he doesn't win the prize because he didn't do an obstacle course. The Virgin doesn't take mine or anyone's difficulties away because we have to overcome them to gain merits for heaven. But help to overcome them, of course, more than enough. A Christian Nigerian girl comes to mind. In the year 1968, this girl fell down a staircase and broke her kneecap. And she had an operation. In the operation, an American doctor removed her kneecap. It was broken. He removed it and left her leg immobilized in such a way that she couldn't bend her knee. She couldn't kneel to go upstairs or climb a hill. It was terrible. She went on a pilgrimage to several Marian places in Spain. One of them was Garabandal. When she arrived at Garabandal, from the village, the climb to the pines is very steep and difficult and rugged, and she could not go up. So two girls helped her up. She couldn't kneel down. She prayed there in the pine trees where the Virgin used to appear. Well, she, re she appeared throughout the whole town, but especially in the pine trees, and they helped her back down. The next day, they went back to say goodbye, but these girls forgot to help her up. From below, seeing the pine trees, she said, I'd like to go up. And she heard an inner voice, climb up, climb up, come. And without thinking twice, she went up. She went up a path that people with crutches cannot go up, at the time at least, because it was horrendous. She went up without crutches or anything. She got to the top and knelt down. The people who were with her looked at her. She came up on her own and he's kneeling. They went back down, and that's another ordeal, and heard a voice that night. Touch your knee. It hadn't occurred to her to do that, apparently. She touched her knee. She had a kneecap. A kneecap had appeared. This is, I'm not going to say the word miracle, because the church has to say it's a miracle. A kneecap appears without anesthesia, without her noticing it. She doesn't have a kneecap, and a kneecap appears without her realizing it. She only realizes that she can move it normally. That's what happened with that girl. I heard about the case because I was given the opportunity to translate it from English. Upon translating it, I was astonished. Then I had the chance to meet people who went with her on the pilgrimage. So I learned the story through writing, but then I had witnesses. Witnesses who were with her on the pilgrimage told me about it. They told me the same story. I also remember a motorcyclist, a guy who had an accident in Catalonia. It was a very serious accident. He had a lot of broken bones. There was no hope. Someone brought him an object kissed by the Virgin and put it under his pillow. The next day, the guy got up, got on his motorcycle and left. You ask me what reasons the Virgin Mary can have to appear in Garabandal. 
Primero pregunta First, a ask her. Eh, pero, But, ¿por qué? Why is the Virgin appearing so much since almost two centuries ago? The first one was the miraculous medal in Rue de Bac in Paris, okay? That's the first one that we can situate in a chain of Marian apparitions. In the Old Testament, when God had to say something, he sent the prophets. Today, he also sends prophets. What I mean is that throughout the 2,000 years of the church, there have been people to whom Jesus, the Virgin, a saint, or an angel, have appeared to, to give them messages throughout the history of the church. And the church acknowledges them. In the Constitution Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council, the charisms are recognized. Moreover, it says, this is very important, that the church is directed with hierarchical and charismatic gifts. Because it does not say just hierarchical, but hierarchical and charismatic gifts. That is, the hierarchy is there, but God intervenes when he feels like it, freely, when and how he feels like it, to say what he wants to say. In 1917, he wanted to give the message of Fatima. He didn't give it to the bishop of Leiria. God shows himself to the humble. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11. So the Virgin appears to simple and humble people, to priests too, to priests also. And many people still receive locutions and revelations from God, directly from Jesus or the Virgin. But apart from this, which is happening today, more than sending prophets, God is sending the Virgin. Jesus sends his own mother, which means that it's more pressing, more urgent. There are variations from, from one message and apparition to another, but the message is the same. The world is going wrong. Humanity has to change. There is an urgent need for conversion. Is the constant request. Then why did she appear in Gerbendal? Well, maybe because she saw a simple place, simple girls, what she likes and that those simple girls could not make anyone who has a little common sense and goodwill think that this is an invention. Some compare Garabandel with Fatima. In Fatima, the Virgin gives a message saying that from the year 1960 it can be opened. It's curious because the year 1917 to 1960 are key years. The Virgin warns about the coming of communism, which had not yet begun in Fatima, in the year 1917. The revolution of the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks began in October. In October, the Virgin had already foretold the triumph of the Bolsheviks in 1917. But the secret is public from the year 1960. The Pope in 1960 is Pope John XXIII, and he doesn't want to publish the secret. He said he didn't want to be a prophet of negative announcements and did not tell it. Pope John XXIII did not tell it then, but the Virgin did. The Virgin told it. I'll wait one more year. You haven't told it in 1960? Now it's 1961, let's go. And in a way, the Virgin is going to continue Fatima. In a way, they are two different things. So it's in a historical moment. I don't know if this subject has been studied, But it is really very important to keep in mind that the Virgin, in the year 1961, begins in Gerbendel until the year 1965, precisely at the moment when the crisis of the Church is about to begin. The crisis that is attributed to Vatican Council. Not to Vatican Council, but to the circumstances of the Council 
There were some theologians with ideas against Christian doctrine. Catholic theologians, they called themselves Catholics, but were defending anti-Catholic doctrine. And they were, in a way, seeding an infection, yet very limited, from their places, especially in the north of Europe. They are part of the council, some even as advisors or secretaries of the bishops attending Vatican Council. But the Virgin begins in the year 1961, before the council begins, and before the beginning of the Mass that will be organized later on. We can see it concretely in the vocation crisis. You can measure it. It can be measured because we could say, oh, it was around 1960-something. I've measured it simply by taking the statistics of vocations in the major seminaries of Spain. And it practically comes to be three years after the beginning of Our Lady's apparitions when that crisis began. And if there were 8,100, 8,200 seminarians before 1964, the number of seminarians dropped to 1,100, 1,200, 1,050, and it stays at 1,000-something. It would be necessary to do a study on how vocations in religious congregations declined. In ours, the Jesuits, there was also a tremendous drop. We should also do a statistical analysis of the Dominicans, Franciscans and Redemptorists, etc., to compare. I have not done it. I've only seen the seminary. It's a sort of reflection of this. So, Garabandel coincides with the warning from a mother who comes to prevent the crisis in the Church. Because the Virgin comes to heal beforehand. She comes not only to cure the wound, but also to heal and prevent it before the wound exists. It's interesting to keep this topic in mind. And perhaps it's worth studying more in depth how the crisis takes place. I'm talking about Spain, because the Virgin appeared, appears in Spain. In other countries, no, I'm talking about apparitions of Garabandal and comparing to the crisis in Spain. If the Virgin had been heeded in Garabandal, things would probably be very different. And we would probably be in a very different situation in Spain. You ask me if Garabandal can be considered as something that is over. No. I don't consider Garabandal as something that was closed, but something that continued then. At the moment, she does not give messages to the girls, in Garabandal at least. I don't know if she gives them where they live. But the Virgin continues to act in Garabandal. The Virgin is still alive in Garabandal. Proof of that is that healings and conversions continue. Proof of that is that I know many people who tell me that when they go to Garabandal, I myself, I myself, and I have recently written this to the Bishop of Santander. When I go to Garabandal, I find peace. It is a peace that is not merely an idyllic peace, as I can find in a forest or at a lake. Okay, that's a psychological peace. No, it's a spiritual peace. There's a difference. So, how many people have told me that they found God in Garabandal? How many people have told me that they feel the Virgin in Garabandal? I would say that the Virgin is still alive in Garabandal. Going to Garabandal does not mean going to remember past events, all well, that too. We remember some past events because that happens. But it is encountering the Virgin. Even if you don't see her physically, some people have seen her. They told me so, although that is not normal that even if you don't see the Virgin physically, if you go with the necessary conditions, yes, it's a living encounter with the Virgin. Garabandal is not a closed case. Garabandal is not over. I would say Garabandal is alive. Garabandal is alive for those who go there with good will. If we have studied this topic correctly, I believe that I have studied it, those two commissions have not been objective. 
Therefore, if in Garabandal or in other places there is a possibility that God speaks, the obligation of the competent bishop is to study it. I believe that in Spain there is a general distrust of everything that refers to supernatural manifestations. I have not found this in South America, for example. In the bishops of America, I generally find an openness to these phenomena. They study them, and if convenient, they approve them. They certainly study them. In other words, there is an openness, a nobility, a sincerity of wanting to know the truth. In Spain, what I observe is a kind of suspicion, a repulsion, and uh, I don't want to. I don't want to study or recognize private revelation. Let's remember that the Church explains it very well. Pope Benedict XVI speaks about this very clearly. So does Vatican II in Lumen Gentium. Public revelations exist. Public revelation, which is sacred scripture, right? Very well. It was closed with the death of the last apostle. But we cannot tell God, now you must remain silent. Because what God has spoken for thousands of years before, why can God no longer speak now? No. God continues to speak when He wants, as He wants, and to whom He wants. The Church calls this private revelation. Just as it has been necessary to discern the public revelation, the Church also studies the manifestations that have continued to exist throughout church history. They're a grace from God, and it's necessary to distinguish and discern. The first obligation of the church, St. Paul says in that very clear text, is to test all things, hold fast what is good, but examine it. There's an obligation to examine the charisms and discern them. The hierarchy has very, a very grave and extremely grave obligation to study possible charisms. Rejecting them is rejecting God. I'm just not into those things. You're not interested when God speaks? You don't consider God to be alive? You don't consider that He's alive and capable of saying things? Well, as that bishop used to say, if the Virgin wants to say something, let the Virgin say it to me. She chooses the humble, therefore she cannot say it to you. She will not exactly want to say it to you. So the attitude of the ecclesiastical authorities has to be one of openness attentive to listen to the word of God. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. This is something the Lord is probably saying today. I repeat, it is a grave obligation to listen and discern. It doesn't mean, the Virgin told me this and that. St. Michael appeared to me and said such and such, and you just believe. No, no, no. They must be studied. But there's an obligation to study them. And if there are signs that they are authentically from God, approve them. To close one's mind to admit private revelation, I'm basing this on the Second Vatican Council, and on documents by Benedict XVI. So it's not an exaggerated opinion of mine, but one taken from the Church. And I'm making the application. If the Church says this, the Council and the Popes said this, then it's only logical that the bishops of the world today should be open to the fact that God may say something. They should not be closed. Regarding what Garabandala contributes specifically, first, we would have to put a fact in common with the other Marian apparitions or non-Marian apparitions. The Lord also manifests himself, for example, Pare de Monial, approved by the Church. So, a mother who speaks to her children at a time when a crisis is brewing, Fatima, Garabandal, or a time already in crisis, such as since the 1960s and onwards, are a common factor in all apparitions. 
but a mother who has many children, each having a different character and in different circumstances. One son is young, the other studies, the other is getting married, the other was setting up a shop. To each of them, she gives advice relative to the situation he's in. She tells them all to be good, to be honest, of course. She has specific notes for each one. In this sense, there's a common factor in the Marian apparitions in Garabandal and in other Marian apparitions. In Garabandal, there are specific things and not. For example, the information about the warning, the miracle, and the possible punishment. It has been spoken of in other previous apparitions, even in past centuries. Not only apparitions, there have been saints, such as in Valencia, St. Vincent Ferrer, and many others who speak very clearly. But perhaps it's in Garabandal where it appears as something typical rather than specific, typical of Garabandal. What is most important today is the message of conversion in the two official messages that were given, the first one from the Virgin and the second from St. Michael the Archangel. There's a very simple text written by the girls because they summarize it in very simple writing. But there it is very clear. But it is also in the whole of the apparitions of Garabandal. It's curious how the Virgin, as I've said, presents herself in different ways in different places. We find that in Fatima, she appears in a tree. On a tree. In Lourdes, she appears high up in a grotto, in a hole in the grotto at Massabiel. In La Salette, in France, she appears weeping in one apparition. There was only one in La Salette. So it's different. Garibandel shatters everyone's preconceptions, and she appears all over the village. I think she visited every single home, because if someone was sick, the girls in ecstasy go there to encourage the sick person with a visit from the Virgin. Since the girls walked all over, she walked throughout all the streets of the town. It's something that has not happened in other apparitions, as far as I know. So the message is a very complete message. Besides, it has a characteristic. Just as in other places she presented herself, I am the Queen of Peace, in Medjugorje, for example, the Queen of Peace. In other places, Our Lady of the Rosary. Here, what I see is that she reveals herself as a loving mother and asks the girls how the cows are doing. Outsiders say, come on, she asks the girls how the cows are? This can't be from God. God is concerned about our details, isn't he? And a mother worries about the details. The girl's concern is the cows that they have out there in the pasture. And the mother worries about the concern of the girls. When girls go home, what do their moms ask them? Does your foot still hurt from this morning? Does your foot hurt? Does your foot still hurt? How are the cows? How's the pasture? Well, that's what the Virgin asks the girls. It's a mother's conversation, the conversation of a mom. Whoever thinks that's strange doesn't know what being a mother means, or doesn't know that the Virgin Mary is a mother, and more of a mother than all the mothers on earth. So what has struck me most in the apparitions of Garabandal is how motherly she is. The Virgin plays hide and seek with the girls. They're 11 or 12 year old girls with a psychology of 8 year olds. It goes with their psychology. If she would have appeared to a theologian, she would have spoken to him in scholastic terms, a modern scholastic, philosophical, and theological terminology. But she doesn't use those words with the girls. She uses words that adapt to the girl's situation, and the girls feel loved by their mother, the Virgin. In that environment, she gives them the message, which is a change of lifestyle.
the message of focusing on the passion of Jesus and on the Eucharist. I remember that quote, less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist. The message is over, but today, less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist, today. At the time, everyone received communion folding their hands on the tongue and kneeling. Today, people receive communion in any way whatsoever. They break church norms, starting with very many priests. Receive communion on your hand. But this priest has no authority to say that. The Universal Church lets the faithful choose freely to receive communion on the hand or on the tongue, wherever it's allowed. The priest shouldn't impose. Sometimes the way communion is distributed gives the impression that the priest is handing out chewing gum. People receive communion in any way. I don't mean interiorly, in mortal sin, because there are many. I am aware that there are a lot of sacrilegious communions received in mortal sin. But even externally, the way people walk into church, hardly anyone genuflects anymore. Many people enter and sit down or sprawl out. They sit there comfortably in a chair. Hey, the Lord is there. The Lord is there. I like to pray before the Blessed Sacrament, exposed in a church. There are so few people. And when I go out, especially if it's in the afternoon, there's so many people in the coffee shops. I didn't know there were so many coffee bars. They're so full. How many people are in football stadiums, at the movies, at the swimming pool, at the beach? And the Adoration Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament is emptier every day. The people who are there are elderly. Young people hardly go. I'm talking about today. I remember so well what was said more than 50 years ago. Less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist. That isn't current? That's over? It's a piece of advice given by the Virgin for that time and for us. What Our Lady said at the time continues to resonate for me as something very current that she said not only for that time, but for us as well. Apart from that, whoever rejects the message of Garibandel rejects the message of the Gospel. I feel sorry for many people who, when they speak of Garibandel, immediately think, what about the warning, the miracle, and the punishment? And I think, come on, the Virgin said that. I think that what she announced will happen. Everybody understands it, and if not, find out. Look it up on the internet. This warning, this miracle, and this punishment will happen given the situation of mankind. When the Virgin said that, at the beginning of the 1960s, the situation was very different. Today, while it seems logical to me that the Lord warns and intervenes, given the state of mankind, the state of religious life in the world today, and the spiritual situation in the world today, However, it seems to me that people go to the morbid. And what she said about the warning, miracle, and punishment, she's like a mother who says, if you don't study, I'll punish you in the summer. A mother who talks to her son all day long, all day long. With a tone of affection, she talks to him, advises, and recommends, and says, and says that, if you fail, I'll punish you. A lot of people take those words morbidly. When's it going to be? What's it going to be like? Why don't we take a look at everything else? Because if we heed the Virgin in everything else, there won't be a chastisement, which is something she said. Perhaps a chastisement will come if mankind does not convert. So it's not a sure thing. If we listen to the Virgin and everything else, there will be no need for that punishment. Let's not be morbid, holding fast to that prediction, but rather that the Virgin did not come to Garibandal to say that. She did say it. Yes, she did say it briefly. And it will come true because the Virgin said it. Well, yes. But the Virgin came to say much more. And the message of Garibandal encompasses much more. It's a lot deeper, motherly, and evangelical. We can't hold on to the morbidity. It's as if we were to study the Gospel, giving utmost importance to the words, in those days, in those days alone. When will those days be? What will they be like? Come on, you have to read the entire Gospel. Live the Gospel and don't worry about those days. In fact, you'll probably die before then. So many people have died already. And they used to ask me, when is the warning going to happen? They're already dead. Stop worrying about the warning. 
Live in the state of grace. Live what the church asks, which means live what Garabandal tells us. Live in the state of grace. Live a Eucharistic life. Live a life of prayer, charity, sacrifice. Live the gospel. Live the gospel. And all these things shall be yours as well. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Don't stick with one word, one sentence, and God will give you everything else. And if you live this way, you won't have to worry about the warning or the miracle, because it won't go for you. Garabandal is marvelous. What Pope Paul VI said is true. Garabandal is the most beautiful story on earth since the gospel. Something like that. The Virgin Mary had been walking around this little mountain village for a few years, and she had been living there. It really is something beautiful. The apparitions themselves were those four years, but I would say that the Virgin is still alive in Garabandal. Not only is she alive in Garabandal, because I, I see her alive in many places. That is, the Virgin is acting, the Virgin is with us. I would say that the message is that the Virgin is a mother who loves us so much that if we discovered how much she loves us, we would weep for joy, we would be moved, our lives would change. If we could realize how much love the Virgin has for each one of us, if we simply knew it, our life would change. The Virgin, the Mother, can't stop looking at us with love. I would say that for us, at this moment, the first thing we would have to do about Garabandal is find out, more than if such and such happened, if the girl said what not, if the competent authority discover how she loves me, each one of us, how much the Virgin loves me, how she is not far away from us, galaxies away, but at our side. She loves me, she cares about my things, and if she doesn't act more, it's because I don't let her. If she doesn't act more, it's because she also respects me and doesn't interfere where she's not called. She's very delicate. But as soon as we invoke her in our lives and go to her, the Virgin will react, and the wonders she worked in Garabandal will be repeated in each one of us with healings. The greatest healings are the healings of the soul, more than those of the body. People often say, I've come to her to be cured, like in Fatima, Lords. I hope she'll cure me. She needs to cure the soul of each one of us, the soul of our Spanish society that is rotten in many aspects. Humanly speaking, we are sinking. We need the hand of a mother to pull us up. So it's not only the message to each person. This is a message for the Spanish society and a message for the whole world. Discover the Virgin's love, that love that she manifested in Garabanda. Discover it. Feel like one of the girls, let's say, and try to feel the love that the girls felt. How the Virgin loved them, we must feel loved by the Virgin as well as by Jesus, the sacred heart of Jesus. What does that mean? It's a heart that beats, that loves, that loves me, that's loving me. If we discover the love of the Virgin and the love of Jesus, our life will change. Deep down, I would say that it is good for us to know all these things about Garabanda, but it shouldn't be out of curiosity. It's good to know the stories, that's fine. But the fundamental thing is that we be protagonists in Garabanda, in the sense of letting the Virgin act in us. Then we could also say how with Mary and in Mary, the Lord has done wonders in my life. Virgin of Garabandal, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.